Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I bet Spotify is just looking at their streams of songs right now and wondering why Rock Me Amadeus is all of a sudden popular. Specifically in the state of Michigan. Yeah, in the Michigan area. Like This song has not been played on Spotify in 10 years. What's happening? It's it's like Master of Puppets and then that song. They're like, what year is it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great. It's been a that was a great name draft for the Red Wings. Absolutely elite draft for names, which is the only thing that matters, really. Nothing else matters. We're no. here. For, we're here for content, not wins. No one knows anything about prospects. <laughs> Everyone knows everything about how fun these names are going to be uh, to hear Mickey and uh, Ken pronounce on the broadcast. Yeah, Max Kill to Amadeus over to Tanias. <laughs> great. <laughs> You're just, <laughs> Ken's Ken's going to nail it. And then you're just going to hear Mick in the background go, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, our favorite episode every year, as long as the Red Wings are in this rebuild, the annual NHL Draft Review episode where we, we recap the NHL Draft specifically from the standpoint of the Detroit Red Wings, go through every pick. And, you know, most years we say whatever other storylines happened and this year, We've been in uh, the studio for an hour and a half, even before we hit record, just mapping out because of everything that happened. From a content and entertainment value, this draft did not disappoint. It was incredible for the parts of it that I could actually experience. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, I, I as teams and organizations, I hate Montreal and Chicago with a passion, uh, as do most Red Wings fans, but... Boy, am I appreciative of the chaos they provided in the last 48 hours. It it was fantastic. Yeah, there was uh there was a moment. We're not going to get into too much detail. The the Patreon exclusive overtime will have more storytelling here, but uh long story short, there was a nationwide outage where we are of all telecoms access, phone, internet, anything. The great internet famine of 2022. Yeah, we were scavengers for Wi-Fi that day. And uh, I found some in the morning, and then I had to go uh, do something quickly. And in that 40-minute window where I was away from internet access, Steve Eisman had traded for Vili Husso, signed Vili Husso, and hired two different coaches. Yeah. <laughs> I was also in Wi-Fi. <laughs> It's like I looked at my phone. And I went, "This is a prank. That's a prank. This is not real. Someone's pranking me. How does all of that happen in this 40-minute window?" Yep. Absolutely. It was great. Like I've never had to go so long without phone access or internet access in my whole life. And it was literally almost half the country. And it's really incredible stuff. And Steve, that's why Steve did it. I We all need to be clear about it. He doesn't like Billy Husso. He doesn't like those coaches. He just saw everything was out in Canada. And he's like, now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make it like now. <laughs> well, uh, we still managed to, in our in our kind of sporadic way, cover day two of the draft. Um, we have a lot of great content to talk to you about. The lead up to the draft, that trade we just talked about, um, every single pick for Detroit, some notable picks from other teams. What did happen in terms of trades? What didn't happen? Steve Eisman mentioned some things about uh, what he wanted to do. And uh, this is just the beginning. The draft content is going to be coming for a long time still because that's the uh, the spillover from the nhl draft uh, additionally free agency is starting soon we're coming up to july 13th which means the nhl uh, storyline train is just going to keep rolling and detroit has some moves to make we're almost fortunate that we got a little sneak preview with Vili huso so stay tuned for all of that um, this is again like i mentioned usually our biggest episode of the year just because of everything that goes into it and how important drafts are to the red wings um, so if you're a new listener, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoy the show and hang on for the ride. If you're a returning listener, oh, well, you're stuck with us now, aren't you? Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, I am one of your hosts here to talk to you about uh, Red Wings hockey and the world of the NHL and beyond, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Oh, slow down there, cowboy. I've had a coffee. I'm yeah. getting fired up. <laughs> <laughs> I was too awake. Uh, on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we will be talking about that trade the Red Wings made and subsequent signing. We'll be talking about the coach hirings. We will be going through the NHL draft kind of sequentially or chronic chronologically for the most part. Uh, we have to kind of explain how things built up, but we're obviously going to be pausing to talk 
pretty extensively about the pick of Marco Casper, eighth overall by the Red Wings. And beyond that, we'll be going through every single Red Wings pick from Dylan James down through Brennan Ali. Uh, we'll be talking about our opinions on the draft overall, some draft grades, because I know people either love or hate those. And then uh, some notes from Eisenman and Draper from after the draft, anything else that comes up in terms of storyline. And we'll, if depending on time, we'll chat a little bit about what might be to come with free agency. So this is a meaty one. It's going to be good. Before we do all that, uh, for those of you who don't know or, or might be new listeners, uh, this podcast is really, really proud to be partnered with the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Um, the more we talk about substance use disorder, the faster we can end the stigma and get support to those in need. The Jamie Daniels Foundation is a children's foundation initiative that was established in memory of Jamie Daniels and founded by Jamie's father and Red Wings lead announcer, who you'll know as Ken Daniels, really good friend of the podcast, and Jamie's mother, Lisa Daniels-Goldman. The foundation strives to end the stigma of substance use disorder and provide support to those struggling with the disease or who are in recovery. To learn more and offer your support, uh, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org. And we have crossed the $32,000 uh, mark for our um, season fundraising campaign through Wings Money on the Board, which we ran in partnership with Prashanth Iyer, and that all goes to the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So thank you all so very much. Okay. Where do we want to start with the Vili Husso trade? Yeah, that's probably the most significant thing that happened outside of the Marco Casper pick. So the Detroit Red Wings, I mean, it was no secret that they were going to move on from Thomas Grice. His contract expired, leaving them with just one NHL caliber goaltender under contract in Alex Nedeljkovic. Alex Nedeljkovic's season last year was either you know pretty good to hot or cold. We'll call it what it is. He slumped at points. It was extended, and it just looked like nothing was going his way. The season did finish with him kind of rounding back into form, especially late March and April. Um, but very obviously, the Red Wings had a massive gap in net. We've talked extensively on this podcast. What's the biggest thing Detroit needs to get rid of? Even if they're not good next year, the blowouts. And that starts with the goaltending. So the Red Wings needed another NHL-level goalie who could step up when Ned wasn't on the top of his game yeah i really like the play here um i didn't think the red wings were going to be in the market for Vili huso because he was arguably the best goalie available uh or goalie available on the free agent market let me just sorry before we get into it here the trade was uh Vili huso the signing rights to Vili huso essentially like six days early or five days early before he was an unrestricted free agent in exchange for pick number seven D three of the 2022 draft. The one that just happened, uh, AKA a third round pick, which St. Louis used to draft Alex Santry Kaskamaki. Cool. So a third round pick for the signing rights to Vili Husso. Yeah. So Vili Husso was looking to be the um, darling of the free agent class for goalies. Cause um, I think it was Elliot Friedman was reporting there was up to 11 to 14 different teams who were in the market for a goalie this year. Um, Minnesota kind of kicked it off re-signing Marc-Andre Fleury. So the other, you know, what you would call big name crown jewel of the free agent class was off the market ahead of time. So Eisenman worked in a quick trade to get ahead of the market and get the guy that they obviously felt was going to be one of the premier pieces. So, Vili Husso himself is coming off a phenomenal year. Um, I think he had like a 919 save percentage. Um, was for stretches of the season one of the best goalies in the league, period. Um, playing behind a strong defensive team, but when you actually go into the analytics of St. Louis's defense, it wasn't as good as people advertise it to be. Not like Carolina's was when Nedeljkovic came over. Oh, you're, yeah, yeah. The defense wasn't as... Yeah, St. Yeah. Louis is a strong team, and obviously... Uh, Huso's still going to probably be in for a bit of shock and awe coming to Detroit from St. Louis. Um, but I think the interesting thing here is Vili Huso is going to be coming over in a very similar circumstance to what Alex Ndelkovic did last year. First year where he got good run as a starter. Um, first really, truly full year in the NHL. Had a phenomenal season. Kind of shaky, questionable playoffs. Not bad, but not as good as his regular season. He was dealt which, a bad hand yeah. where he had to come in and do the impossible. Against the Stanley Cup champion Colorado Avalanche. You're both very right. 
I think it was a bad playoffs. I think that playoffs is exactly what priced him back into Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't say he had a good playoffs. No, yeah. I don't think it was as bad as people advertised it to be, but it, it wasn't great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but what I think Eisman's doing here, which I like, is a couple things. One, we saw what happened with Nadelkovich when he came over from Carolina, which you already alluded to. He was either very hot or very cold, and there wasn't a whole lot of in between. Welcome to the Detroit Red Wings defense, yep. baby. Yep. The same thing is – there's a strong possibility the same thing is going to happen with Huso, where he'll either be very hot or very cold, again, behind the same – what is likely to be subpar defense. Hopefully, Lalone can help that, and it won't be as bad. And, you know, with Edvinson coming over and hopefully a free agent signing or two, it should be better. I think we can safely assume it will be better. To what degree of how much better? I don't know. I'd be concerned if it worse if it was worse. You'd actually have to yeah. try to make that defense worse. But what ultimately happens here – is between Nadelkovic and Huso, there won't be a lot of moments this season where both are cold, where both are in the cold stretches. You only need one of them to be running hot at any moment, and you're fine. And when you have two guys of very similar skill sets, backgrounds, risks, whatever you want to call it, the odds are throughout 80 to 90% of the season, you will have one guy riding a heater, and then it's up to the coach to deploy them properly. So... Then you get the two further years of certainty with Huso, which brings me to my second point why I like this. Nedeljkovic, as much as we like him and as much as we think he is a good goalie and that we think most of his, most, not all, of his weaknesses last year in cold streaks were due to the team in front of him, he might not be back after a year because he might just choose to not re-sign with Detroit. He is a pending unrestricted free agent. Yeah, let me interject here. So... After the trade, it was immediately agreed upon. And we'll talk a little bit about how this happens. Vili Husso signed on three years, $4.75 million per year. Alex Nedeljkovic has one year left on his contract at $3 million. So this is his last he's – he, he's an unrestricted free agent as of right now after the 2022-2023 season with the Red Wings. So that's where the Red Wings goaltending tandem stands. Husso has two years of term over – Nedeljkovic left. Yeah, so there's a lot of scenarios that could play out here, and signing Vili Husso makes sense for all of them, if I'm being honest. Um, Alex Nedeljkovic comes in this into the season, and he's great, and the Red Wings extend him. And now the Red Wings have a very, very good tandem for what should be the first couple years of their quote-unquote playoff window. I don't think this year is that window, but I think years two and three of Husso's contract probably should be. So if you're running those two years with Nadelkovic and Huso, that's probably a very good thing to have. Yeah. Uh, the other one, Nadelkovic comes in and to this season and he's not good. And then you have Huso as your insurance plan to, okay, well, we try We took the gamble on Nadelkovic. It didn't work out. Maybe it does with Huso. Maybe it doesn't. Great. Either way, you have a, a solution for two further years. You're not left with yeah. Thomas Grice or like a poor broken Jimmy Howard or an injured exactly. uh, uh, Bernier. Anyhow. Yeah. Nadelkovic comes into the season is great. Prices himself out of Detroit, probably gets a haul at the deadline and you still have Huso for two more years. So there's a lot of scenarios here where this works out very well for Detroit. There is the option of both of them are bad and you're kind of stuck holding the bag with Huso, but not Nadelkovic because his contract's up at the end of the year, which isn't ideal, but you know, Huso doesn't cost so much that if, they both suck, and you have to find another goalie next summer. It's not the end of the world. Something for me that this also does is what did we see from Sebastian Kosa over the last year? Same, the kind of talent that you drafted him for and traded up for, um, but he's got a ways to go in terms of getting to an NHL pro game. You know, we talk about defensemen needing a lot of reps. Goaltenders, even before they get to the reps, they need time before they're prepared for NHL shots. At on you know a 30 35 plus game season basis so kosa can't be forced in you can't carter heart him you can't you can't destroy uh his confidence as a goalie because that's such a mental position so long story short here they got their bases covered for a few more years or they should um i really like the point you brought up brad about they have now flexibility with nadelkovich eisman in his post draft um uh, media availability actually went out of his way or maybe it was pre-draft i can't remember he went out of his way to say you know this signing of of huso at 4.75 for three years that doesn't stop them from extending ned he's like we can still extend Nedeljkovic. like that's an option for us so 
He went out of his way to say that. So I have no impression that Eisenman has lost confidence in Nedeljkovic or anything like that. I think we saw quite a bit from Nedeljkovic last year in the good moments where you're like, no, there's a, there's still a great goalie in there. Um, you can't make any declarations about where he sits in the organization until you get a better defense in front of him. But you now have a 1A, 1B scenario, or at the very least, as Eisenman said, as you said, Brad, guys who can come in and give you a chance to win on any given night where, yeah, there's going to be nights where a goalie messes up and they're bad and, you know, five minutes in the game, you have four goals against. But that should ha- happen less and you shouldn't have to go to that same guy the next game because that's your only option because that's what happened to the Red Wings last season. Yeah, because Grace was just plainly bad for a majority of the season. So when Ned had his down streaks, there was no solution there. Yeah, Grace default, usually bad. And Ned sometimes also bad. So for a good chunk of the season, the Red Wings had very little to speak of for defense and nothing for goaltending. And that's how you got 9, 10, 11 goals against. And the team also looked noticeably worse when Thomas Grice was in net. They did, yeah. So now that you've got Huso, who's had a great season with St. Louis outside the playoffs, but we already talked about that, you're getting two guys who could probably put your stock in night in and night out and neither will be required to play the lion's share of games. If one guy gets hot, they're going to ride him. If one guy gets cold, they'll take the other guy in. Like it's going to be a really nice relationship and it'll be nice to see two guys who frankly have to earn a starting position. It's, it's almost always good for goalies when you make them compete. If you have two good goalies and you make them compete, some people's default is, well, that's not great because you have a good goalie and what if, it, what if it pisses them off? Competition breeds success and competition breeds Look, productivity. we've got three telecom co- <laughs> businesses in Canada. There's no competition and they're stupid and they don't know what to do and you get price gouged. That's a great... And they go down and we oh. can't do anything. So at, there you go. And the Look whole at that country tie-in. grinds to a halt because... Wow. The, yeah. uh, the allegory here turns out the... Uh... <laughs> The old goblin Canada is just is just an allegory for for bad goaltending. The but- great the great thing for me is in this whole thing is the Red Wings got ahead of every other team looking for goalies. Yeah, because who's left? I mean, the Red Wings are not in on Darcy Kemper, nor should they be. But there were lots of rumors about them being in on Jack Campbell, and that never materialized. And the reports out of Toronto is there's a massive gap between the team and player in terms of contracts. So the Red Wings had a plan, they executed it and they got ahead of everybody else. So I I imagine when that trade happened and the signing happened, there were quite a few upset teams to say, well, Oh yeah. Why didn't we do this? So it's actually a really good point you brought up, Evan, because I, you know, a lot of people said, why would you give up a third round pick just for the signing rights? Cause like I said, it was for essentially five days of exclusive negotiation. That's how it works by the book. Here's how it actually went down. Maybe for the most part, no one will know for sure unless you ask Eisman or the agent and they feel like telling you, but this is how this kind of co- contract and trade generally works. Eisman's not making that trade unless they've connected with Huso's agent and said, do we have a deal here? They make a totally not tampering. No one would ever do that conversation slash backdoor agreement where they're like, yeah, he'll come for this term and this money, which is three times 4.75. And then Detroit makes the trade of the third round pick to secure his signing rights to sign the deal. And your question now might be, well, Ryan, if they knew they had an agreement, why not just not give up the third round pick and then wait? So much price goes way up probably. Because like you said, Evan, there are not enough goalies available. Teams, Teams will get wind. If that deal isn't signed right away, teams would get wind of the fact that Huso was going to sign that the moment free agency opened. They would up their offer. They would then try to trade something to St. Louis to get exclusive negotiating rights. Huso could just change his mind. Prime example, and I brought this up on the live stream, Edmonton thought they were getting Jacob Markstrom last year. They went to bed thinking they had him, and they woke up with him having changed his mind going to Calgary. And, you know, that's just a change of heart. Sometimes the money makes a difference. If someone came in and offered Huso three years times $6 million, he's taking that. Huso made a lot of sense to me in, in Edmonton, too. So... Like I said, there's a lot of goaltending needy teams, and Billy Husso is probably near the top of a lot of their lists. And when teams panic, that's when overpayments happen. But And you kind of touched on this, and it's not tampering if St. Louis grants Detroit permission to talk to him, correct? No. So what probably happened here is Eisenman and St. Louis 
had a deal in place saying, hey, I will give you this pick if we can extend Huso. But you have to let us. Yeah, that's the other way. This, yeah, this they, but you have to let us talk to him. So the Red Wings probably had, here's the deal that we will do. Let us talk to him. St. Louis said, no problem. Here you go. Again, I'm sure there's probably some conversations with the agent totally. That totally didn't happen beforehand. Right. But once the Red Wings got indication that Huso might be interested in signing Detroit, you call up St. Louis. Hey, we want to talk to him. This is the deal we'll make. St. Louis says, yep, I'm on board with that. Better to get a third-round pick than nothing for him. Go ahead, talk to him. And if he agrees an extension, we'll make the trade. Eisenman calls up Huso's agent. What are you looking for? Three years, 475. Done. Hey, uh, who's it? Doug Armstrong in uh, St. Louis. Dougie, we got a deal. Deal. Huso signs. That's why it came together so quick. That's probably pretty close to the how things actually shook down in terms of why the trade was made. And because, like you said, Ryan, and you're not wrong. Huso would not have got 475 if he went to UFA. He would have got more than that and probably more term. And it is worth noting, he's still a bit of a wild card. He is not a certainty to be a starting goalie because he only had the one year, right? Now, that being said, he has a track record of being a good prospect. He, he didn't come out of nowhere. But the Red Wings went out of their way and got their guy. The way the draft shook down, honestly, that third round pick, who cares? Whatever. Um, so not even a little rattled about that. And the Red Wings got, like I said, what probably was the most desirable goalie to a lot of teams on the market. Because even though you get a little more certainty with Campbell, he's going to cost a hell of a lot more in terms of actual dollars and term. Colorado traded two-thirds and a fifth for Georgiev from who, New York. Who I think is worse than Huso. And for his signing rights. And um, what it, and New Jersey gave up more for Vanacek, if I'm not mistaken, who I, I definitely think is worse than Huso. A second and a third for Vanacek and a second. Yeah, so uh, basically a third-round pick, about the same. So I think it was a tidy piece of business for the Red Wings, and it, it solves a lot of problems going forward one way or another. Yeah, the third-round pick, I know you have to assign value to picks and you can't just throw them away. But for the surplus of picks that the Red Wings have had over the last hundred years, it seems, um, and the price of four point seven five, considering all of Detroit's cap space, if you if those are overpayments, those are marginal overpayments. I'm very, I'm not just fine with it. I love that move for Detroit. People think it's an overpayment. Well, you know, people are. It, I think it's fair. You're like, not what's many. market? Like, what's market value? Did you have to give up the third? The thing is, Eisenman was right you have to pay the price if you want a guy and especially in a, in a in a seller's market you have to make sure that you secure your asset it's this isn't something that's in stock all the time you can't just walk into a store and grab it it's like trying to find a ps5 when right at the beginning or middle or end like you need to just be up at 3 a.m waiting for a drop to beat the bots to it and that's the thing you you, you paid the premium to do it so i i really like that from eisman i think that's a great show of uh, what he's been saying has been honest, which is that he's just trying to make this team better bit by bit. Last year, what was the crux for Detroit in a lot of games? Goaltending. So this also, and, and just to, to put a bow on this, this is as clear of an indication as ever, right? Eisman's not tanking for Bedard, Michkov. No, I don't think I don't think this move and a lot of the other things Eisman likely will do is for this year. I don't really think he cares. How it's not it going to put him into a, the the... Cup contention. Yeah, I don't even think Eisenman's making these moves with the plans on trying to get to the playoffs this year. If it happens, great. But no, this is the Huso move is for years two and three. Very clearly, for all the reasons I talked about earlier, where that's probably when the Red Wings want to start being playoff regulars. And also as, I'll call it Nadelkovic insurance. Yeah. For, again, all the reasons I already talked about. All right. Uh, other news, even before draft here. Um we're going to talk about this happened after round one. This happened pre day two of the draft. Uh, but two coaching hires. The Red Wings hired Bob Bugner recently uh, let go from the San Jose Sharks from his head coaching role there. But Bob Bugner was hired as associate coach under Derek Lalonde and joining Alex Tangay on the bench uh, in Hockey Town. So uh, Bugner, it's practically a hometown boy. I mean, Windsor P listeners here from Windsor will know his name um, from Windsor coach Windsor to a couple of Memorial Cups his he's that's a, a small hockey world in Windsor everyone in Windsor hockey knows each other and Bugner's Bugner's name is everywhere for good reason uh, so it's really great to see him have a homecoming back to uh, back to Detroit so right across the river from his home and yeah the Red Wings get some NHL head coaching experience behind the bench he's also 
drafted by the Red Wings. Yes, from that the famous 1989 draft, drafted ahead of notable superstars Nick Lidstrom, Sergei Fedorov, and Vladimir Konstantinov. Yeah, Mike Sillinger was their first round pick. Bob Bugner was their second round pick, <laughs> and then Lidstrom around later, <laughs> Fedorov around later, and uh, they drafted Dallas Drake that draft, and they dra- also drafted um one vladimir konstantinov in round 11 that might that the red wings 1989 draft is the single greatest draft any team's had in the history of hockey but. i bet you that draft was even though it was 11 rounds was six hours or shorter oh than the draft yeah now. they just got up there and just said the name left yeah but so to, what does that mean because he was he's been touted as a guy who's going to focus on the defensive side of the game for the red wings well based on what he did defensively with uh, san jose uh doesn't inspire me with confidence <laughs> Um, how geared was San Jose to have a good defensive system? They though? didn't. They had Mark Edward Vlasic as their defensive defenseman, who is like nine years past his prime. Uh, Brent Burns and Eric Carlson, not their specialty. Uh, Mara Ferraro made some good strides over there. So, you know, that's something. But um, generally speaking, when you can get a guy with head coaching experience to come in as an, an assistant coach, it's generally a positive because – it allows him to focus um, rather than running the whole ship. Um, given that Derek Lalonde is a first-time NHL head coach, having someone in his ear who's been there, done that, will certainly help with a lot of things. Um, just because, you know, Lalonde's going to experience a lot of things he never has before, and Bugner has. So he can be someone to lean on in those circumstances, which is good. Uh, I'm concerned. I feel like Bugner has a bit too much hair for this role. <laughs> that uh, was a real shocking one. Yeah. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. The shampoo and the arena showers are finally going to get used. <laughs> hey, there's, there's always the razor, right? So, yeah. Um, he can always do it by choice, but, uh, yeah, overall I, I'm, I'm whelmed. I, I don't think he's like this super miracle assistant coach who's going to come in and fix everything. Um, but I also don't think he's incompetent. I don't think he's going to make things worse. Um, I, I think it's a perfectly adequate hire. I just don't think you can be anything ever than whelmed for an assistant or associate coach hiring, period. A head coach and what he does in his head coaching job, which is way broader of a uh, of a you know set of purview or, or way broader of a purview is different than when you're an assistant or associate coach and you can just focus on one or two things and the dynamic of who you're working with and what you're asked to do and what you're expected to make decisions on every day. The way I see this is the Red Wings have good experience, good support behind the bench for Lalonde and Tangay now. And, you know, I, I'm not going to project San Jose's defensive situation onto Detroit's until we see it play out. Yeah, I mean, Boomer was really given a bad hand in San Jose. Like, Doug Wilson did not provide him a team that was going to have any success. Like, Kind of awkward with Burns and Carlson. They all have taken a step back in terms of their overall game. Couture really hasn't flourished like people were expecting. And I'd say a lot of the rookies and younger players did actually improve under under Boobner. So, yeah, I, like you guys said, it's I'm not you know, jumping up and down because they hired an assistant coach that I like. But I think he provides some experience to the unproven coaching staff. Um, so it seems like a good hire to me. I, it's, it should be noted that Derek Lalone, this was his decision. Like he brought it to Steve Eisenman, uh, essentially Lalone and Eisenman compared lists in terms of who they wanted. And Lalone was the one who went out and said, I want Bob Bugner. Eisenman gave him 100, 100% of his support and Bugner was hired. I will also say at a human level, it's nice that Bugner was able to find the role because San Jose let him go very, very late in the game. Yeah, San Jose might have sewered themselves in future coaching hires oh, because yeah. they generally, if you let a coach go, it always sucks, but you want to do it early enough in the offseason so that those guys can go get jobs again. And by the time the Sharks let Bugner go, almost all of the head coaching vacancies were filled. So he had almost no choice but to accept an assistant coaching role. So, um, you know, and that wasn't even a guarantee given how late in the process it was. So it's good. Yeah. Like you said, from a human standpoint to see Bugner land on his feet after San Jose really dealt him a, a crappy hand. Uh, and very quickly here, I know it's 
just to speak to how much content there is. We're like half an hour in and still not at the draft yet. So we're about to get there in a second. But Detroit brought in Alex Westland uh, as goaltending coach. Um, he has He's coming from Hershey in the AHL. Uh, some notable names he worked with there are Vitek Vanacek and uh, Ilya Samsonov. So, you know, aside from how they've gone once they've hit the NHL and, and how they've kind of held their own there, and that's a different conversation more for Washington fans and New Jersey fans now, but um, – Good work with them in the AHL and especially breaking into the NHL. So that bodes well. My deep analysis on this is after seeing how the Red Wings goaltending has fared the last uh, little while, it can only help. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's it can't, it'd be hard to make it worse. Exactly. And part of that, I'm sure, is the goalie and the personnel. And, but you know, at the very least, they have a plan in place. And he's expecting Sebastian Cosa with open arms coming his way in, in, you know, X amount of years or months, maybe. Um, and then he has Vili Huso and, and Alex and to keep on track here and to maximize. And any goaltending coach in Detroit is going to have a tall task because, as we talked about, you know, Moritz Sider won the Calder and that was still a god awful defense overall, They're, that defensive core. So hopefully Eisman can do some, do some things in free agency and maybe some trades to improve that core. But those goalies are going to need to maximize every night. I'm really hoping he's a strong coach on the mental end of things. Cause we know Nadelkovich and Huso when they're on our quality NHL goaltending, get goaltenders consistency. If this guy can help with consistency, then that is worth every cent of this hire. Okay. NHL draft time. Hell yeah. The Detroit Red Wings selected Marco Casper with their eighth overall pick, but boy, did a lot happen before we got there. So <laughs> yeah. why don't we rewind a little bit and give you a little bit, a little bit of a walk. The first four hours of the draft. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's worth mentioning. I don't think the Red Wings end up with Casper if certain things uh, don't happen before the draft. And that starts with the Alex DeBrinket trade. Alex Debrinkit from Chicago. Chicago decided that morning to rebuild, in essence. Yep. And 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 good on them for recognizing the mistakes that they made trying to immediately flip it and then just going saying, you know what? Let's do this before our, our assets lose value. Yes. So Chicago dealt Alex Debrinkit, who has one year left on his six point four million dollar contract. He has a very expensive qualifying offer and a very expensive future contract coming up because he is a 40 goal scorer in the NHL and still in his prime firmly. Yeah. Cause despite only being paid six or whatever that contract was this year, which was very cheap for Alex to brink it. The way the contract was structured is his qualifying offer is a minimum of $9 million. So he is going to be, and you know what paying for a 40 goal scorer who's not yet 25 years oh, old. Oh yeah. He's, he's worth nine mil. But, but uh, Ottawa's going to have to pay. And in exchange for Alex DeBrinkett, Ottawa traded a 2024 third, a 2022 second round pick, which ended up being Paul Ludwinski, and a 2022 first round pick, which, yes, is pick number seven, which was right before Detroit. We'll talk about who Chicago took with that pick in a little while here. But why is this important? Well, we, in, in profiling all the players that were likely to go to Detroit, Outside of preference, we identified Marco Casper as probably the premier center next to Cutter Goche, who is even less likely to make a Detroit that checked all the, Cutter Goche is even a center, which is still a question. All of the Eisenman boxes in terms of what he was looking for in any draft pick, but especially his top draft pick, uh, and two, position of need, which is center. Goche and Casper both centers. Goche was almost never like it, it was almost guaranteed he'd go at philly but even those who thought he might not go to philly they said he's not making it past columbus we had some information that ottawa really loved casper but also ottawa was publicly saying there's a 50 50 uh, chance that we trade this pick that's what they ended up doing so with ottawa out the way out of the way that made that moved one team that moved the floor for casper out of the picture, if that makes sense. Like we really never thought Casper was going to make a pass seven if Ottawa was there, but Ottawa moved themselves out of the picture, and then all that opened things wide open for the Red Wings. Yeah, it went so far as the Ottawa sixty sevens in the OHL drafted Marco Casper's rights in the import draft, even though Marco Casper probably never really had any intention or any reason to come over to the CHL unless the team that drafted him would like him to. So. We'll uh, we'll we'll open the draft. 
by talking about how Uri Slavkovsky went first overall. Montreal took Uri Slavkovsky, not Shane Wright. Shane Wright, as when he when he was picked later, stared down the Montreal draft table, which people will have their opinions. I thought was hilarious. We need more entertainment in the NHL. That was awesome, and you know what? Seattle has to be thrilled because they now have a motivated Shane Wright who's pissed off and has something to prove. Like, like Philip Zadina. I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> At least he didn't have a line like that. Thank God. Yeah. Jeez. Um, and Slavkovsky went first. And you know what? Credit to people like Corey Promen and Bob McKenzie who called this happening. Um, and then Simon Nemich, second to New Jersey. And again, That one shocked me. Corey, Corey said, he, he, he said you're a check, but he said overall, you know, the Devils have he sure the Devils have Jack Hughes. The Devils want to compete. And you know, does it hurt to have three premier centers? No. I, I There's don't, no salary cap. They could probably afford to keep all three. But they realized that Simon Nemich was solving a big problem for that team, and they took their guy. Third, Arizona, after what was a – hour of speaking on stage good god we need to change the format of the draft just because of that speech by the coyotes my god nobody was buying a word he was saying and it went on forever like i said on the live stream if the if detroit ever hosts the draft we have an obligation as a fan base to start booing after 10 to 15 seconds anyone but detroit it's okay when Detroit talks. Yeah, well, it's but Detroit doesn't. <laughs> Eisenman's my favorite. He just goes up there after because he just goes up and says the name and then gets the hell out of the way. Someone was they were still interviewing Shane Wright and Steve Eisenman was halfway done their pick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Arizona went with Logan Cooley. They they went with the American kid. And you know what? It's not just because Cooley was American and they want to sell to their fans. Cooley has been seen by some as a potentially more dynamic player than Wright. That opinion is debatable. I, I think it's, it's razor-thin margins or... It just depends on preference, but they went with Logan Cooley, and I don't hate that pick, but what was shocking was Shane Wright goes to four, and I genuinely believe that the Red Wings were at the very least looking, if not working the phones, to either move up to Arizona or Seattle's picks, because those are two premier centers, and if you can get either one of those, you said it on the live stream, Evan, eventually you need to make your move to get your guy, and centers of those calibers don't come up often there was zero percent chance seattle was moving that pick oh unless, they're over the moon unless the offer was enormous what's funny is uh, as eisman was walking off the stage after they made their pick later he like kind of stopped to talk to the arizona table seemed to be joking around about something and i just can't help but think was he really working arizona for their pick was he we heard the reports and the rumors and we had you know, some info beforehand that he was going to try to Either before move. this was before the draft, before we knew Slavkovsky was going on, before we knew Nemich was going number two. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I, I think Arizona was probably the pick where he was trying to make it happen. And as we saw with Arizona later, they were they were active in like pick swapping and stuff like that that day. So they might have been receptive to it. Obviously, when you're picking three and Shane Wright and Logan Cooley are there, it's going to take an Enormous. absolute haul to to move off that pick and obviously Eisenman, if he was on the phone with them wasn't willing to pay what they were asking but uh yeah it that first four picks the exact four players we thought would go in the top four absolutely nowhere near the order we thought they would go in yeah it was like little pockets of chaos they were self-contained yeah, yeah we were talking about that before we started recording where if you just looked at the group of players that went in every like five to ten pick Increment, it, it went about as expected, but it went nowhere near the order anybody was expecting. That might be my favorite top 10 in the NHL draft that we've live streamed. That we've covered, yeah. yeah. It was, was a blast. phenomenal. Like Between the trades for Chicago to get pick seven, Shane Wright, who I still stand by, is going to be the best player in this draft, going four to the guy that we didn't think the Red Wings would have a chance at getting, being able... like getting to their pick because of all the other craziness, even going later in the draft, you know, um, the big pick swap between the Coyotes and the Sharks, just, you know, three premium picks to move up to pick. I forget where the uh, 11, ca- 11 Camel and like Mackey falling as far as they did uh, teams, not being that scared of the Russian factor, apparently because Marashnichenko and Europe did not fall as far as we thought they might. It was, Oh, it was fantastic entertainment value beyond the fact that, Teams were walking up to the stage with 37 employees and talking for 12 and a half minutes and dragging on what should be a three-hour production to four and a half hours 
beyond that and the team's trying to, you know, ruin the entertainment value themselves, it was fantastic theater. So Cutter Gauthier, after Shane Wright was gleefully taken by uh, the Seattle Kraken, Cutter Gauthier did end up going to Philly and uh, Columbus made no mistake to grab a very talented David Yerichek, who we were hoping would fall out, but um, they went with their guy. And then Chicago came in and, you know, after dealing to brink it, and they also traded Kirby Doc. So what happened with that was Montreal traded pick 13 to, uh, or sorry, they acquired pick 13 from the Islanders in exchange for defenseman Alexander Romanoff and pick 98, which was a fourth. And then they immediately flipped that pick. So 13th overall in a third, which was 66th in exchange for Kirby Doc. So Chicago got quite a haul for Kirby Doc. So Chicago got rid of Doc and Debrinket in one day. And we thought they might go Savoy here. They might go Casper here. They might go forward. They took Kevin Korczynski, who I'll say that wasn't wildly off where consensus rankings were for whatever that means. Um, I think anywhere from like 11 to 15 people would have been like, yes, that is where Kor- Kevin Korczynski is going to go. Uh, they took him at seven. And immediately when that happened, what did we start saying on the live stream? Marco Casper is there for Detroit. This is almost an automatic pick for the Red Wings. I'd be surprised if they thought it was a good chance he would be there at pick eight. Out of everything that the Red Wings have done in the last 48 hours, I would say the only predictable thing they did was Marco Casper at eight. Not that I ne- we all necessarily think he was the best player available there because he, he was very high on my board and he was right in that range. You know, in terms of pure talent, I still think I like Matt Savoy better, but Marco Casper checks every box for what Steve Eisman looks for in a player fast, highly competitive, probably the most competitive player in the draft in terms of like, you know, who's willing to run through how many walls on the ice. Um, he builds the walls before each game to run through. Yeah. High hockey IQ. The only real question about Marco Casper is what is his ultimate offensive upside? And we talked about this in the live stream, but we're going to repeat it here. Marco Casper has the most complete game of maybe anybody in this draft. He's a full 200 foot player and he has no weaknesses as a player. Defensively, he's sound. Transitionally, he's sound. Offensively, he can produce. He gets to high danger yeah, areas. He gets he drives the net, he can play the perimeter, he can play off the cycle. He's hard on pucks, he battles. He has enough skill to make the plays happen. He can he's got a good shot, he's got good hands. The argument against Marco Casper is he's not really elite at anything. You can't say he has one of the best shots in the draft. You can't say he has the best hands in the draft. You can't say he's the best skater in the draft. He is well above average at all of these things. So the exciting thing is with Marco Casper is his floor is very, very, very high. If he is anything less than a really good third line center in the NHL, I'll be shocked Mm -hmm. because he could probably walk in next season and be a decent third line center in the NHL. I don't think he's going to make the NHL next year, nor do I think he should. I think the development's more important for him. I think the, but he could also be all the way up to a very good top end second line center, kind of like in that Dylan Larkin range where is he a a number one center? Is he a second line center? Could he do both? I, I think that's where he could get into that Dylan Larkin type range and everything in between. I saw someone post something in terms of, not necessarily stylistic comparisons, but range of outcomes for Marco Casper. He could be anywhere from Sam Bennett to Sean Couturier. And I think that's fair. Now, Max. obviously Couturier being on the, the everything goes right. Sam Bennett being, okay, this is on the lower end of where he thought he would be, but everything in between is possible as well. Uh, Max Boltman, our, our good friend from the Athletic Detroit, also makes the like notes. Bennett is a possibility. Uh, Sorelli is also yeah. another name. And like whenever people make these player comparisons, they're not saying that's guaranteed what they're going to be. It's just a like easy benchmark to say. If you're looking at role to production type yeah. of player, right? Not that, again, stylistically, does Casper match up with those three guys? Not fully. It's just, you know, Sean Couturier is a Selkie nominated forward who can put up 60 to 80 points is that in the range of possibility for marco casper yeah absolutely sam bennett and anthony sorelli have never had 50 point seasons but they are complete 200 foot players that winning teams need to have not necessarily second line centers depending on how stacked your team is but still very valuable so again it's just giving you the 
an idea of a range of possibilities. So Eisman did walk onto stage very succinctly and efficiently said the Detroit Red Wings select Marco Casper uh, out of Rogla in Sweden. Uh, he is Austrian, so presumably he would speak German, which would uh, be nice for Moritz Seider. I'm not sure if Pew Suter does as well, but there's at least one more German-speaking uh, uh, player to come into the room. But Rogla will be familiar also because that's where Moritz Seider played his uh, SHL season before coming over to the Red Wings. Fun fact. Marco Casper's first SHL point was an assist on a Moritz Satter goal. Yeah, that was when Ice Hockey Gibbs posted that. I was like, that it's all prophetic. I, uh, I honestly, Brad, I think your your analysis of who is who he is as a player is is correct. Like he is a run through a wall, highly competitive, but not in a way where it comes at the expense of all skill or, or offensive IQ or anything. Player, he thinks the game really well. He's one of those players that uses his energy and physicality as a tool to get the puck up the ice and drive the net and get into high danger areas. A, a, an oversimplification of it here is, is he going to score the prettiest goals or is he, are his uh, one-on-one skills elite or is this going to be, um, you know, the most flashy player? No, but if the pucks end up in the net all the same, if the puck moves up the ice all the same, and if he's responsible in his own zone all the same, I think calling him a jack of all trades, master of none is actually underselling it a little bit, or at least that's what the Red Wings say. Eisenman took it upon himself to say that his offensive skill is underrated, actually. Like everyone agrees about his floor. You know, third line center, responsible both ways, high, high motor, high compete, um, thinks the game well, but what's his offensive upside? And Eisenman said, we're underselling his offensive skill a bit. Which. Which NHL European scouting team has earned the trust more than Hakan Anderson and Steve Eisman and the Detroit Red Wings uh, to say, yeah, we've scouted this guy and the public consensus on him is a little off. Something about him is being underappreciated. There's untapped potential. Do I think Matthew Savoy was the more skilled player there? Yeah, I think so. But in terms of, I, I also think Marco Casper is way, way more likely to land at a center at the NHL level. And, Frankly, to me, that matters for the Detroit Red Wings more. I know you're not supposed to draft a position, but at some point you needed something other than Dylan Larkin. So within the range of players that could have gone there, Marco Casper was firmly within that tier of, yeah, this is one of the preferred guys that's, that's going to be good for the Red Wings. Transparently, my preferred pick at that point, just for the record here, was Matt Savoy. But we all knew and expected it would be Casper when, when Chicago passed up. There's a reality here where Matt Savoy is the better player, but Marco Casper fills the bigger need, thus helps the Red Wings win more games. Yeah, makes a bigger impact for Detroit. Yeah. Those two players, to me, are almost completely opposite in terms of your philosophy on drafting, right? Mm -hmm. Marco Casper, probably one of the most NHL-ready prospects yeah. in the first round. Like He's played in the SHL since he was 16, so he's played the pro game longer than everybody else, it seems like. And then you look at Matt Savoy, you know, we all know Matt Savoy took the ring into Mordor. Like, we all get it. And we're not sure if he's going to be a center, but if he hits, he's going to be over a point per game player in the NHL and he's going to be a little water bug and it, he's going to be a great player. So it's, it's two totally different players in, from my perspective. Which one you go with is really up to your team's drafting philosophy. Um, the Red Wings want to take swings later in other rounds, which they, they did. Um, then do that and get the guy in the first round who's like, all right, his floor in the general consensus is he's going to be a third line center. It's like, okay, great. That's fantastic. Yeah. We, we can need... find a second line center at some point if we need to. If we have a, a trunk full of prospects and picks we can trade later to find that 2C, we'll do that. There's a couple things here that I think about in terms of what would be disappointing and also what was realistic. I'll say... I really would be mildly, at least mildly disappointed if Marco Casper doesn't have, you know, an untapped offensive game and he settles in as a nothing more than a third line center, but a but good one. But he plays a thousand games for Detroit. Then, then yeah, how are you going to complain about that? And that leads into my other point of like, okay, if his floor but realistic landing spot is a, a really good third line center, there are a lot of drafts where at eighth overall you don't get that. No, and um, so if that's where it ends <clears> up. <throat> Michael Rasmussen. <laughs> 
Why? Why? First it's Adina, now the Rasmussen. Evan, it's I'm on the hate train today. <laughs> Just, we have our internet back. What do you got okay. to the vibe for? Make your Chalosky joke now so we don't have yeah. to wait for it on the I next. I thought, honestly, you were going to do it. I, I already – how many times did I say that during the live stream? Like four yeah. or five times. There's probably people that had to take shots every single time I said it. Yeah. Um, I'll be the first person to say it, and I said it on the live stream, I'm not – that was not my preferred pick. I don't see the offensive upside in him, but I will also argue myself there, and he was second in U18 scoring in the SHL. So do I have any concrete opinion on Marco Casper? Clearly I do not. <laughs> but my gut reaction when they picked him was, I'm not the largest fan of this. But as time has progressed since what was 40,000 hours ago since the draft started, they're actually just wrapping up, Yeah, believe it or not. Brian Burke's been asleep since their <laughs> first round pick. Um, you know what? I, I honestly can't be upset with it because he checks so many boxes. Like he does everything very well and deserving of an eighth overall pick. Like if he finds a, any improvement in his offensive game, which I think he absolutely can, it'll be a great pick. I I think with. If they went way further off the board and, you know, grabbed a guy who, like you said, Evan, didn't check so many boxes, you there would be a lot more cause to, even if you weren't the biggest Marco Casper fan or you were way higher on Frank Nazar or Matt Savoy or whatever, you'd have a lot of cause, I, I think, to be, you know, upset. Or they went with a winger like Jimmy Snuggerud or something like that. Then you'd say, oh, man, I'm actually really pissed off about this pick. But even if you didn't have Marco Casper one, two, three, four, or 5 on your board... I really don't think there's any way to deny that this fills a need in a big way for the Red Wings at the very least, wherein he's going to make an impact on the team, even at his floor, even at his floor with a big asterisk of <laughs> it's way too early to say definitively for any prospect. I'll just get it out of the way. You know, so we didn't think had much offensive upside, most side or anyways. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, I said on. that to Woodward sports and I'm like, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but we just saw this play out. Yeah. But um, I can't get past this pick without talking about intangibles. And everybody stop rolling your eyes. It's easy to talk about intangibles where it doesn't mean anything. But so to, to put some meaning to it, obviously, um, I think it was in Max's article. He talked to one of the Abbots in Rogla. And they went out of their way to talk about why it's a great pick as Marco Casper, the person, as well as the player. And when you have a high character, high compete guy like Marco Casper, it's easy to just throw that statement out there and be like, oh, he's a great guy. But what does that actually mean in the context of a hockey player? In relative to us talking, well, he could stand to improve some of his skills, which then would improve his offensive upside. When you have a guy with the character and the desire to win and the desire to learn like a Marco Casper, it means he's going to take the time and do everything in his power to improve his weaknesses, right? And he doesn't have any, so it's really just to make these things better, to find ways to get more assists, to find ways to get more goals, to improve his stick handling, to improve his shot, whatever that might be. Whatever the Red Wings tell him to focus on and improve, he's going to. Yeah. With the, with the type of player like a Marco Casper and the type of person he is, there's no question that he's going to try. Well, again, it's all to degrees of success. Is he going to develop enough offense to become a first line center? Yeah, no, we're all skeptical of that. I would bet on him getting good, improving it enough to be a second line center. I, I, I trust Eisman and I trust the running scouting team when they say, yeah, there's still a lot of untapped offensive potential there. They said the same thing with Mo Sider. They were right. So we have to give him the benefit of the doubt on that. And again, you couple that with the intangibles Marco Casper has, it's more likely than not he's going to improve. It's just how much. And the funniest thing to me is, is like people can harp on this pick and whatnot and say, oh, we didn't go for the guy who's the flashiest. Marco Casper's got a lot of grit to his game, and he could very well be a fan favorite because he loves to roll guys over and he loves to play that, you know, grind line style game. Not to say that he has no skill outside of that. Like that's, but playing with a little bit of sandpaper is part of his game is in and the Red Wings fan base will fall in love with, with that kind of play style. Tyler Bertuzzi is one of the most coveted players in the NHL right now because he's a productive player who plays with sandpaper. And he's there's no flash to his game. And I think that's what we... He's got the wicked hair. Well, hat. Yeah. 
But I think we, as you know, a podcast, we as fans, we as a fan base, tend to pigeonhole players when we talk about offensive upside as sick hands, stupid, fast, unreal shot. How many top end centers are there in the NHL who don't check any of those boxes? You know, other than shootouts, we don't see Alex Barkov do a whole hell of a lot that's flashy. We don't see Patrice Bergeron do anything that's flashy. You don't see Sean Couturier do anything that's flashy. They're just effective. They're smart, and they have enough skill to do the things they know they need so to do. So he's not Nathan McKinnon and not uh, Austin Matthews. No, but that's not to say he can't be an effective top-end center. Have you seen them in the same room? That is true. Yeah. That's a good point. So just because a guy isn't flashy doesn't mean he's not skilled and effective. And I kind of just want to leave my... it is to be flashy at the NHL level? Exactly. Um, you, I want to talk about one thing about his game, which makes me optimistic you know we talk about how this is a guy who's going to you know bang in the pucks in the dirty areas get to the high danger areas using like drive and power in his really good skating the part that makes me really confident in a how he's going to develop like what you're talking about brad in, in terms of focusing on whatever skills they they ask him to focus on um and, and b any other aspects of his game in terms of maturity and, and sticking at center he thinks the game really well yeah. Brad has been the never-ending foghorn for Hockey IQ for years on this podcast. We talk about it all the time, and it's not just a meme. The way you think the game speaks to how well you are likely to be able to develop. And it's not a perfect one-to-one, and sometimes the complete meatheads can get better and be effective, of course, in different ways. But this is a guy who, like Evan said, was playing against grown men in the SHL. That's a pro hockey league. And... He's been touted as a really strong thinker of the game. To be a centerman, an effective top six centerman, you have to think the game really well. To develop in ways that people that weren't expecting you to develop, to kind of push the boundaries of what was reasonably expected of you, I think you have to think the game really well. And for him to be as mature and as effective on the ice against grown men as he's been so far, you have to think the game really well. Marco Casper isn't just some pinball or, or, or cannonball bouncing around the ice, just ricocheting off people and hoping the puck goes in. No, it's all calculated. And that to me is if they take an eighth overall pick, who's just a, you know, a complete like gunpowder, grit sandpaper, just hit everything and, and see what's left on the ice. When you get off your shift, Luke Lindenning. That's different than adding a guy who does that in a measured way. Who's thinking the game. And that's why when Eisman says his skill is underrated, yeah, as he grows to be more than a 17, 18-year-old and he uses that hockey IQ, it bodes really well. Yeah. Yeah, and I could, again, keep running through the examples of all the top six centers like in the NHL that don't fit the mold of a McKinnon or a McDavid. It's it's more than not. So, again, I'll, I'll leave it at the three things that we have seen Iserman consistently look for in draft picks, especially as high draft picks. They're quick. They compete. They're smart. Check, check, check. Very quickly, before we move on to the rest of the Red Wings draft, what is the timeline look like for Marco Casper? Right now, I would think he will spend one more year in Rogla. Great program. Um, probably as a middle six center. Because again, because Rogla was such a stacked team this year, he did have to spend a lot of time low in the lineup and on the wing. So I think he'll probably play middle six center for them this year. Honestly, I think he's got a real good shot to come over to Detroit the year after that. Maybe a year in Grand Rapids. But I think, again, with how complete and how foundationally sound his game is, if the Red Wings see enough improvement over the course of this season in the SHL on the things they ask him to improve on, he he could be one year away from the NHL. All right, folks, more to come on Casper. We We didn't even talk about his strong international play at both the junior and national levels uh, for Austria. There's going to be a lot of conversation about him very obviously here. So uh, stay tuned for that. We did allude to uh, Max's article. Again, that's Max Boltman from The Athletic Detroit. We'll link the article in the description of this episode. Uh, he's had a lot of fantastic co- uh, content come out uh, post-draft so and during the draft. So that's always worth the price of admission. So uh, more to come. But for now, we are going to take a quick break to tell you that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. They're a sponsor that gives hockey fans what we really need, even more excitement, like a wild top four of the NHL draft. There are so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. They're simple to use with great odds on different betting markets, giving you more action every game day. 
Plus, there are tons of fun with unique bet types like same game parlay and exclusive promos on the biggest events. And when you win, you get your winnings back safely in as little as 24 hours. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win that first bet. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you'll get up to $1,000 back in site credit. Now what we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today to get started with that risk-free bet of up to $1,000 and be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. Must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, or Virginia, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. So that was uh, the Marco Casper pick eighth overall. Um, some notable things that happened there. There was movement. You know, the the Chicago Blackhawks ended up with pick 13, which they used to take Frank Nazer. Before that, Arizona traded their uh, of Carolina's first, which was 27th overall. Arizona's second round pick, 34th overall. And the Islanders' second round pick, which was 45th overall, which turned into Bystet, uh, Lund, and Havlid. And they moved up to 11, and Arizona took Connor and Geeky. So they took Cooley and Geeky, so two two centers. Yep. I um, yep. think they got both picks wrong. That's fine. And elsewhere in the first round, the Leafs moved Peter Mrazek out to drop out, drop back 13 spots. So Chicago took on Peter Mrazek, and uh, they took Toronto's 25th overall pick and traded their second-round pick, which was for 38th. Edmonton ended up... Uh, getting or giving away Zach Cassian pick 29 2024 third and 2025 second in exchange for 2022 first round pick which was Colorado's 32nd overall yeah they essentially had to move back three spots and then give away a second and a third to yeah, unload that awful contract Zach Cassian yeah and uh, yeah the Leafs only the Leafs in previous years had to give up straight up give up a first round pick to move one year of Patrick Marleau's contract. And somehow Chicago thought it was worth it to just have them move back 13 picks to unload two years of Peter Mrazic's contract. So tidy piece of work there by Dubas. Chicago was a weird team this year, but before we get into the rest of the teams, like, I mean, we can talk about LeCarrie Mackey falling to 15th. Uh, we can talk about Kemmel going to 17th, but uh, why don't we get into the rest of the Detroit Red Wings pick here? Dylan James at 40th overall, uh, Rookie of the year in the USHL last season, played for Sioux City, um, left winger. A little bit of a, I shouldn't say surprise. I think we talk about this a lot. Once you get past the first round, throw away all your expectations because teams draft lists are just so wildly different than what you think. And they don't operate in the same way as, you know, public consensus or anything like that. So Dylan James is probably not fair to make a direct comparison, but a, a Carter Mazur type pick in terms of. I don't know, the the style of player that they went for here and where they took him. It, it reminded me a lot of the same same kind of feelings that when uh, Carter Mazur got drafted. I know I meant talked about this a bit when we we're talking about Marco Casper, and I feel like it applies even more here. When you think of a guy's top end upside and you talk about, you know, ceilings and skill, remember, it's not always about how flashy they are. Those are two different things. Dylan James ain't going to wow you. He's not a burner. His skating is probably below average. He's got a wicked shot, good hands. What he does, though, is he, again, like Casper, he competes in the offensive zone and the defensive zone. He's got a 200-foot game, and, and he really works hard to make things happen. But he's got good hockey IQ in the sense that he knows how to move around the offensive zone to help the players around him. You're not the USHL Rookie of the Year, and you're not near a point per game in the USHL by accident, right? Even though he was playing on a good team and with good players, you need guys that can do that. I'm not saying in terms of skill sets, they're the same, but if he's going to succeed at the NHL level, it's going to be in the Tyler Bertuzzi role. He's not going to be the guy that's going to come in and drive a line like a Dylan Larkin or a Lucas Raymond, um, or even a Jacob Verana. But he's that guy that you put him with good players can make really good things happen. 
if everything goes right for him, you know, Zach Hyman type role, Tyler Bertuzzi type role, Brian Russ type role. Again, not skill set comparisons, but where and how he could succeed in the NHL level. So I think on his own, he doesn't have the skill or the upside to drive a top six role in the NHL. Um, was it my preferred pick there? No, I had a lot of players I would have taken over him there, but it's again, justifiable, but you need guys like that when you jump up levels. Um, he's going to North Dakota, which is a great program for development. So, um, that's definitely a huge positive. And again, he did produce. It's not like he was a passenger, like he was making things happen and he was helping out and he could play a prominent role in Detroit if everything goes well for him. Yeah, you know, talking about the names that were left on the board, of course, you know, there was Adele Bell Blues, Noah Warren went right after him. Some folks were big on Seamus Casey, uh, Jack Hughes. Later on in that round, Gleb Trikazov, but Lane Hudson. But thinking about the player, Dylan James, I essentially think what they... It's hard to say what a player's true offensive upside is. Like, he did produce really well, and it looks like if that's going to stick at the NHL level... From my understanding, what I've been able to dig up on him since he was drafted, that probably isn't going to come from like a hockey IQ, driving the play kind of style like you mentioned, Brad. He's probably going to have to work on his skating and bring that up to NHL speed so that when he's not afraid to get into the dirty areas and play a real grinding physical uh, game where he just kind of disrupts, that's how he could possibly, you know, bring more production and continue to make an impact on the ice. That cannonball thing I was talking about earlier about Marco Casper, you know, Marco Casper has the additional like really high hockey IQ level layered onto that. Pretty much remove that and uh, not entirely different in terms of what they would probably be looking for for Dylan James here. So so he's committed to uh, the University of North Dakota. Great program. And he's going to have a a good opportunity there to continue to kind of grow and make that impact. So the Red Wings are going to want to see his his skating improve. Um, The Red Wings are going to want to see him continue to be productive and and round out his game that way. But yeah, they're I think those that kind of player archetype you're talking about, Brad, that's what makes sense in terms of what they're looking for. Yeah, he's big, plays a hard nosed style game, and he scores a lot of goals in close to the net. That is all fine and dandy for sure. And you need guys who are able to to play that style of game. I think one thing that would help him make it to the next level is being able to score off the rush. But he's got a lot of the the skill set that you need to carve out a nice career at the NHL level. So when the wing, Wings went with him with their first, second round pick, you know, you can always say, oh, I had other guys here and other guys there and guys that would have taken over him if they like his game and you know it looks rather translatable to the nhl level it seems like a good pick to me dmitry buchelnikov we'll talk more about like pick positionality reaches whatnot after but uh we'll do a a quick summary of of our thoughts but we're gonna go through pick by pick dmitry buchelnikov uh at a saint petersburg in the mhl honestly i think one of my most Outside of Marco Casper, probably my favorite pick of the draft for Detroit, just because does it look like they reached for a guy? Does it look like they drafted a guy who wasn't on a lot of people's radars at all? Is this a little bit of an unknown? An unknown? Yes, yes, and yes. But is this one of the most intriguing players in the entire draft period? Also, yes. They seem to have found someone who's played with uh, Matt Vemichkov, someone who has produced highly in the MHL. Um, wicked talent unreal shot and just any sense of the game especially in the offensive zone the way he kind of can break any moment the way he can kind of change the play almost seemingly at will this guy is oozing with talent um he's he's really really interesting as a prospect to me you know when people play nhl like the video game and they're clearly playing at a difficulty that's too low yeah and the bot the computer is kind of like just pylons and you're like toe dragging around them and just going shelf yeah that's literally what his highlight clips look like <laughs> every single one yeah and like that's a highlight reel of course like that's only gonna show the best parts of his game but it's it's legitimate. the fact that he can do it is ridiculous it's batty yeah, this is your upside pick in the more traditional sense, <laughs> in the sense that uh, this guy's going to be a top six star in the NHL or never be there. Yeah. He's either going to be playing the KHL his entire life 
and never step foot in the NHL or he'll be a star in the NHL. Yeah. He, his reaction time on the ice is absurd. We always talk about making, you don't have to be fast to play fast. Yeah. That's, that's Buchelnikov. Not that he's a slow skater, but I wouldn't call him a burner, but he is able to change the play and his mental processing power to do it is absurd. He could be in the middle of trying to drag it through a guy's leg and it legs and it doesn't work. And he turns it into a quick move, burn wide. All of a sudden the pucks in the net before the defenseman realized what has happened. His processing power is very, we'll call it Kucherov like Mm -hmm. in the sense that he's just able to know everything that's happening at all times and has the talent to be able to pull off the ridiculous shit he needs to do. To make it happen. Now, not to say he's a perfect player. He's he's tiny. He's he's a very small. I think he's listed at what five ten, one hundred and sixty or something like that. Yeah. So he's got a long way to go in terms of that. Um, you know, with that naturally comes. Yeah, he's he's a very one way player right now. His top end speed could use a little bit of work. Um, his physical, like this cycle game. Could use some work. He'll get eaten alive at the pro game as right he is now. right if he now. Doesn't yeah. Strengthen, yeah. yeah. But he can play from the perimeter and the outsides when he needs to, because uh, again, his processing power is great, and he's able to find those seams and make those plays. He's also got a bomb of a shot for for a smaller guy. He can rip it. So if you think of how Kucherov plays the game, that's kind of how Buchelnikov plays the game in the sense that he can make those highlight real plays. And he can stand on the outside and just, you know, tee off shots or make plays. Um, he, he doesn't have the talent to the same degree Kucherov has, obviously, or else he wouldn't have went in the second round. Um, right. But that, that's kind of the, the archetype you're looking at here if he is going to succeed at the NHL level because, man, are his good plays impressive. Um, so he's just got to find a way to translate it up levels. Yeah, and if you're saying like, "Well, this guy is so skilled. Why did he go at in for Detroit's second second round pick? Was it 52nd overall?" Yeah. Um, well, as, aside from what these two guys just mentioned, and Brady talked about, he's going to need to strengthen. He's going to need to work to win puck battles and not get kind of ground out on the boards. But also, he didn't get a single KHL game, and that hurts viewings. It's very obviously hard to scout in Russia right now. Draper said like. All of his footage, uh, viewings of him were via tape. The Red Wings had one scout there to who saw him quite a bit, who was kind of banging his fist on the table for him. Um, the MHL is very hard to get a gauge of how strong a prospect really is because, like I said, it you can look like an absolute god out there at times and then go and play in the KHL and be a complete non-factor. The MHL is a very unbalanced league. You got your super teams and you got your – Teams just gasping for air every time they're playing a team, uh, one of the super teams there. So when you have no experience above that level, it it does make it super risky that his skill set won't translate up levels, especially as an overager for this draft, albeit barely. He was only nine days eligible for last year's draft. So, but um, yeah. when you watch this kid, it is ludicrous. Yeah, just if you don't believe us, just. Go Google him or go on YouTube and watch his clips, and it is actually ridiculous. It might be unfair for me to say, call him underscouted. Uh, Vakarov, Nikolai Vakarov is, was the Detroit scout in Russia. I should have mentioned earlier, but it might be fair, unfair for me to say that he was underscouted, but very obviously he surprised some people with where he was. I the, the general sense I get is that the Red Wings were nervous that other teams were kind of onto it. And they didn't want to risk waiting to get him because their next pick after that wasn't until the fourth round. So they didn't have no, they had no picks in the third. And if they really wanted this kid, who, you know, Brad, you said that he's he's a different kind of high upside. Dylan James, his upside is uh, it's a little mysterious, but he could have turned into something really impactful. Dmitry Bachelnikov's upside is like traditionally what people are thinking. Like this guy is super skilled. Like Evan said, he might end up being a star if he makes it. It's all or nothing. And to me, they, it's all or nothing. And they didn't want that to get away from them, so they they used their second of their two second round picks at pick fifty two, and they they paid the premium. If you think there's a premium, and they got their guy, uh, the lack of ca- uh, flash that Casper and Dylan James have is made up for with Buchelnikov. <laughs> if, if, uh, if he adds forty pounds of weight, and anyone can teach him semblance of two hundred foot game, 
this guy is going to be a star in the NHL. It and clip it <laughs> for the inverse because it's a hundred percent possible that that never occurs. But if it does, this is a absolute home run. He is obviously Marco Casper is the you know title card of this draft. Buchelnikov is absolutely the most interesting prospect that they've taken who could be the biggest impact i think casper included so we'll see how that one pans out i agree with you evan though I, this is either going to be all or not for There's me all or nothing no one that i watched in the draft who can shoot a one-timer like he can with pace and accuracy it it simply is amazing to watch so the Red Wings had three fourth round picks, nothing in the third. And this was an interesting year because they didn't do the usual shuffling around of picks, you know, move one fourth for a later fourth and next year's fifth and stuff like that. So they kept their picks. And once things got rolling and the first of their fourth round picks uh, at 105th overall was Anton Johansson. Stop me if you've heard this before. Big six foot four Swedish defenseman uh, out of Lexand. Um Shoots right, though. So that's uh, that's notable. So the Red Wings added... A, a Steve Eisman, Chris Draper, Hakan Anderson, classic defenseman in terms of uh, the, the size and what they're looking for on the blue line. So thoughts on the Anton Johansson pick? A big Swedish defenseman. It's worked out before, so it's so crazy it just might work again. Uh, honestly, he was one of those guys at time of draft – he he kind of came out of nowhere, didn't know really anything about him. So have been crunching the scouting reports, the tape and everything in the, in the time since. And um, I don't have a lot more to add because there is not a lot out there on him. He is a, uh, truthfully, he's a re- analysis by eyes. Like if you didn't, don't see him in person, you probably don't know a whole lot about him. Yeah. So he's he's someone that you're going to have to dig more into, but just in terms of like the checks the boxes, yeah, the yeah, prerequisites I, are checked. <laughs> yeah, that's our uh, that's our drink. If you hear us say it, check the boxes this year is the thing. And I mean, you want to add more more depth and talent on the right side. What have we been saying? You don't really want not that you don't want, but it's not a priority on the left side of the defense to add more. You know, this guy could be second pair. This guy could be third pair defenseman. Now is the time to try to fill in the right side. You know, behind more each side or so. That's uh, that was the first of their fourth round picks. Keep hydrating the the pipeline. Yeah, and then the next one, Rock Me Amadeus Lombardi. Uh, they've obviously a lot of uh, listeners would have been familiar with him. He played for the Flint Firebirds last year. Centerman, um, smaller side. I think he was listed at like five eleven, five ten, five eleven, eleven one sixty five. But uh, I really like the Amadeus Lombardi pick. Yeah, once you get out of the second round, this is definitely the pick. Uh, in the later rounds that intrigues me the most. Obviously, he played a key role on a very good Flint team that uh, went to the finals this year in the OHL. Um, Near a point-per-game player, overager. Uh, This was his 18-year-old season in the OHL, so his third year of OHL eligibility, Um, which is kind of what makes him interesting. Because obviously, I watched him a bit with Flint this year, and I, I wouldn't say he really jumped off the page a whole hell of a lot to me, but he definitely looked effective talented can absolutely justify a fourth round pick on what he did this year um when i actually started doing my digging after the fact though is where it it caught got really intriguing for me because obviously you you liked what you saw from him um skill wise speed wise compete wise with flint this year and like i said he was 18 it was his overage year he already passed through the draft once this is his first year in the ohl Mm -hmm. his First year of OHL eligibility as a 16-year-old, he went back and played uh, his U18 minor hockey season. Did not go to junior, did not go to the OHL. He played U18 AAA hockey. That's not uncommon um, for for depth players in the OHL. Um, and then they come in and they have their 17-year-old season be their rookie season. Um, most of those guys generally don't turn out to be a whole hell of a lot, traditionally speaking. Uh, every once in a while, you do get your Jack Quinns of the world who who yep. go into the 17-year-old season and actually do turn out to be a somebody. So there is precedence for that. Except for the fact that in his 17-year-old OHL season, uh, the OHL didn't have a season. So he didn't play. Which Shane Wright will tell you. Yep. He didn't play that year. So 
It wasn't until his third year of OHL eligibility did he finally get a chance to play something above minor hockey. And he was near a point-per-game player as a centerman on a top team in the OHL. Second leading scorer on the team, too. Like, there is a lot of room for growth still with all the development he hasn't had. This was his first year, again, of truly competitive hockey. So I'm not saying he will, because you never know. But everything's shaping up that he could be the wild card where there could still be a lot more to his game that we don't know just because of all the missed development. So, again, based on what he did this year and this year alone, you can justify a fourth round pick. And then you throw in all the external crazy factors in his development that leads you to believe there could still be more there. I I find the pick very intriguing. It's got good traits like. I think, you know, being 165 pounds, obviously you need to get bigger because you will get destroyed at the pro level. Especially if you want to play center. Especially if you want to play center. Um, But, I mean, he's got great vision from all the tape I've watched. He's a great playmaker. And he produces. So the fact that you get someone like this in the fourth round, I really like this pick again, and he has a a crazy good name. Yeah, and the other thing to the with the foundation he can build on is his skating for me. So it's definitely if you're drafting anyone in the fourth round, you're not getting anyone in the fourth round who's going to end up being a good NHLer unless they improve as compared to where they are now, and he has things to improve on, as Brad and Evan just outlined. But badass name, and I think a good foundation to build on, and another center drafted, which I love to see. Chris Draper joked he was like, I was. Uh, I was about to go off script and uh, do the Rock Me Amadeus referencing Falco. And uh, he's like, but I backed out of it. I think that would have been hilarious. But uh, And Prashant actually, in our mock draft, Prashant Iyer was like, I, I want them to take Amadeus Lombardi. That's one of the names he, he mentioned. So, hey, look at that. The Red Wings had some fun on draft day. That was good. Uh, and with their, I think their last of their three fourth round picks, that's right, Maximilian Kilpanen, or uh, if you want to go with the Duke Nukem name, Max Kill. <laughs> <laughs> Brad loves. Uh, I believe he was listed as a left winger, but I've also seen him listed as a center uh, from the Swedish junior circuit, circuit in uh, Orebro. I'm so sorry, Lars. I know I mispronounced that. Um, but that is, he's a guy who kind of produced pretty well uh, in his, in the Swedish junior circuit uh, last season and seems to have offensive ability, more of a kind of a net driving or uh around the net dirty areas kind of guy. But um, to me is, is aside from having the Swedish connection, being a player uh, who could potentially again, be in Detroit center pipeline. So your thoughts on Maximilian Kilpanen, another great name, just such a good name. Yeah. How, how are you named Max? But anyway, so yeah, so um, a near point per game player in the J 20 national, um, which is obviously a good start. Um, simple game. Really, really likes to to play fast, drive the net, make the simple plays happen. Ultimate offensive upside. Again, I don't see a ton there. Um, it's a fourth round pick. It's a literally the last pick of the fourth round. But the fact that he can produce uh, 14 goals in, I think, 25 games. So he, he definitely has a nose for the net. Sure. it's a, You make the gamble. You trust your European scouts here in the fourth round. And... You know, if he does develop a bit more playmaking and and he's able to find ways to succeed when the game slows down, there might be something there. Um, he's again, admittedly one of the prospects I, I'm I'm hoping to see a lot more tape on. Yeah, um, it's been Max talked about that the team liked his uh, his skating and his hockey sense. So I'm, I'm hoping to see more more footage just to kind of watch how that plays out. And of course, as he continues in the Swedish leagues, hopefully moving up to the SHL at some point, we'll see how that kind of pans out at the pro level. Yeah, exactly. Um, bit of a wild card. So when you get into the mid- middle rounds, uh, yeah, take your swings. One thing that we didn't talk about, uh, Bushelnikov, that was the last bit of the Mantha trade. Yes. Yeah. So yep. when you're talking about the return for Mantha, and obviously Red Wings fans are thrilled about that. <laughs> think you added all of that with mantha and then you added an extremely high upside wild card player in dmitry bachelnikov so yeah so what is it now it's uh verana kosa ponik bachelnikov yeah which ponik was he a cap dump yes did he score that sweet goal where he flipped the puck 100 feet into the air oh no was he the one who put it in he put it in yeah yeah 
Um, okay, with the fifth round pick that Detroit had, they had just the one fifth round pick. They took Tanias Mathurin uh, out of North Bay in the OHL. Um, little, I mean, I don't think this is a game breaking defensive uh, uh, defenseman that they took shoots left, but he was interesting to me. He's he's touted as a big, steady defensive defender. Com- hurt. Stop me if you've heard this before. Competes hard. Uh, seems to use his size reasonably well in the defensive zone has a good acuity for how to defend using his size um some folks think that there is more to be said about his offensive game as of right now it's not something you'll notice on the ice a lot uh it looks like he does have some skill in terms of transitioning the puck but in general like any pick at this range he's gonna have to work on a lot of things to make it at the nhl level there was that sweet video of him with the uh the tweener pass to set up the goal that was awesome yeah he's he's shown flashes of having some offensive upside but largely it hasn't been there really popped uh, would probably be the more fair way to put it if it was there with how well he can defend and his defensive mobility he wouldn't have went in the fifth round so uh, you know i i know we're over qualifying everything in this episode but it, it's worth mentioning if his offensive game does evolve out of almost nowhere fantastic fifth round pick but otherwise it's your typical project pick you when you get into the late rounds you generally are picking players who have one very good quality and then you're hoping they develop two or three more he's a big defenseman who defends well there's your quality Mm -hmm. now you're hoping he develops one or two more traits that can project up levels uh, and then the Red Wings didn't pick in the set six rounds. They had two seventh round picks at 201st overall. They took Owen Mellenbacher uh, out of Muskegon in the USHL. So obviously would have been familiar with him. Um, An NCAA commit who we're really hoping doesn't commit. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that'd be good for us locally because uh, the Kitchen Rangers hold this OHL. Race. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, in all seriousness, Mellenbacher is another one, you know, tag him as a, as a center position, someone who they took, uh, Good size. He's what is it, six two, one ninety already. So he's not the strongest skater, and that would be why he's he's that far down as a seventh round pick. Uh, other thoughts on Mellenbacher? They, you'll notice the trend with uh, their next seventh round pick as well. You take the size, you take the tools. They find ways to get the puck to the net, in the net through half decent playmaking, half decent goal scoring, still a lot of refining and a lot improving to do, but they, they definitely had a type in this round. <laughs> yeah. You joked about the NCAA commit part. I, I hope he goes to the university of Wisconsin. It's a good program, good program over there. And you see what he can do at the NCAA level. And their last pick of the draft, they didn't do that thing where they traded back in the whole th- rounds two through seven took just over three and a half hours. It was an amazing. It was a gift after the first night. Yeah, th- that was the only thing when uh, they were talking on 32 Thoughts this morning about, oh, maybe tra- change the dra- draft format and like maybe teams like host draft parties and draft from there. Please never remote ever again. Good God. Yeah. No. This was so much better. I mean, for the parts of it we could experience. Yeah. I couldn't imagine having to sit in my car hunt for Wi-Fi for eight hours. <laughs> Uh, with their 212th pick in the last pick uh, of the draft for them, their second of two seven, uh, seventh round picks, they took Brennan Ali, who was at the draft, which was cool. The only one of the Red Wings day two picks that was at the draft. <laughs> Drafted him uh, out of high school, uh, centerman. Um, he did get a couple of US NTDP games, and I believe yep. uh, he was ranked as high as, I think, second or third round on some I boards. think Craig Budden had him in the second round. Um High compete, ring the bell, uh, seems to drive the net really well. A good north-south player. Yes. And if you're wondering, okay, high compete drives the net really well, the east-west is what they wanted to work on. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, was one of the top performers in the fitness testing at the Combine. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. That's something. If you're going to grab a seventh-round pick, the last pick of the draft, and get a guy who some people thought was worth it in the third round, yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah. Again, is he probably going to be anything? Nah. If he was, he wouldn't have been drafted in the seventh round. But he could be. But he could be. There are players in the seventh round a lot of the time who who do end up making there's, it. There's usually one to two per year. So Well, the Red Wings have two possibilities there. Uh, I'd say I'll leave more likely than Mellenbacher. But, hey, it starts at the board. So you, got a, you got a strong... Found it. You got a strong north south game to work off of, and a guy who's in an apparently crazy good physical shape. Good start for a seventh rounder. 
So the Red Wings draft class, Marco Casper, center, Dylan James, winger, Buchelnikov, winger, Anton uh, Johansson, defenseman, Amadeus Lombardi, centerman, Maximilian Kilpinen, uh, center, winger, depending, Tanias Mathurin, de- uh, defenseman, Owen Mellenbacher, center, and Brennan Ali, center. So how many uh, premier top six potential centers did they take? Probably one in Marco Casper, but the Red Wings absolutely, you know, the way it shook out is they grabbed at least four, maybe five swings uh, at the at filling the center pipeline a little bit. So that was addressed. They grabbed a few wingers and a couple defensemen in there as well. No goaltenders this year, notably, but, I mean, they grabbed Billy Husso, so you can say that's who they got for their third-round pick. Um, overall thoughts on this draft class? So getting back to stuff we've talked about before, before I get into my philosophy. If Marco Casper is the only regular NHLer out of this draft for the Red Wings, it's a good draft. If he's a top six center, it's a great draft. If they get Casper as a top six center and one other guy as an NHL regular, it's an excellent draft. Like that's how hard the NHL draft is. If you get two full-time NHLers out of one draft, it's a great draft. If you get three, it's a phenomenal draft. Um, So if... Marco Casper is your number two center. Dylan James is your third line winger for a long time. Like they're NHL regulars and they're good in those roles. It's a fantastic draft. Everything else beyond them doesn't matter. If one of the late round guys pans out, even better. If Buchelnikov hits on top of Casper, phenomenal draft. The reason the draft is hard is because beyond Casper, none of the guys are likely. Right. And it's always worth keeping that in the back of your head. You look at any good NHL team's draft. Go back, pick any team any year of the draft. Very rarely will you find more than two NHL regulars. That's why I tend to buy into Carolina's philosophy of drafting, where they just grab the highest upside guys at every pick. Yeah, They do not draft for third-line wingers. They do not draft for bottom-pairing defensemen. They're like, if we have two guys out of any given draft, it's two top six forwards or two top four defensemen. Like, they swing for upside. I don't think the Red Wings did that particularly well this draft overall. Um, They took a lot of guys who could be, outside of Marco Casper, middle six wingers, bottom pairing defensemen, fourth line guys, and philosophically, That's not how I would approach the draft. Do I like a lot of the players they took? Yeah, I do. I I don't think they had a particularly bad draft. Again, do I think they'll get multiple NHLers out of here? Probably. Do I like, I love this swing on Buchelnikov. Um, I like, I'm super intrigued by Lombardi, like I said. Would I have went in with many of the guys they took outside of the first round? Eh, probably not. The way the board shook down this year, it didn't actually get all that crazy. A lot of the guys you expected to go in the second round went in the second round. So there weren't those guys falling down the board that you're screaming to take. Didn't happen this year. So the fact they took a lot of unknowns and a lot of swings in the fourth, fifth, and seventh round, sure. I mean, there wasn't much else they could do there. Do I love the upside on a Johansson, a Mathurin? No, not really. Do I think Kilpinen's anything special? Not really. Again, I'm intrigued by Lombardi just because of his trajectory. Super intrigued by Buchelnikov. Overall, I'd say I'm whelmed. I I think they could have done better. Time will tell. Again, it's a stupid thing to say. Because, you know, if five of these guys hit, holy hell, it's the best draft they've had since 1989. But again, odd state it won't be. Philosophically, I think they just, they're on a different page than I would be. And that's all right, because it's hard. Most NHL teams tend to line up with the way the Red Wings do. Most teams don't do what the Hurricanes do. Again, B minus, C plus draft for me. I think what we said earlier is is what holds true for me. This draft lives and dies by how Marco Casper does. Yeah. I agree with you. The upside on the Buchelnikov is the other really notable thing in terms of what could really impact this team in a big you know, 15 to 20 plus minutes a night kind of way. Um, but Marco Casper is going to dictate how this draft actually moves the Red Wings rebuild and success moving forward. And if he hits in a big way and everyone else just completely fizzles out, 
Yes, we'll have criticisms of all those picks, et cetera. We'll look retrospectively to see what could have been done differently, who was left on the board, whatever. But Marco Casper panning out is the single biggest priority for the Detroit Red Wings this year uh, and in this draft class. We talked, um, a lot of people were asking for second round targets for a long time as we were doing our player profiles. And you'll notice we kind of have gotten away from that as the years have gone on. And Brad, you alluded to this. There are public consensus and there are natural echo chambers that form. And the fact of the matter is the, the way the NHL scouting world works is different than kind of what's available to everyone else. And they also don't approach a draft from an all teams basis. A lot of teams come in with, with a subset of guys, a list of, you know, X number, 30, 40, 50 guys. And they, these are the only ones they consider. So what we might view as, oh, Luca Del Bell Blues is there at that pick and he's sliding down the board. Well, if the Red Wings or whatever team don't even have him on their list, then it's immaterial. And, you know, we've seen that time and time again, and that's something that we've learned. I, I joked in the group chat at some point, I'm like, this is such a Red Wings this is such a Red Wings draft in terms of how it's shaking out of, okay, Del Bell Blues is on the board and who do they take with their first pick? A guy where people are either scrambling to learn who Dylan James is or they're looking deep into their notes to find out who he is uh, as a player. That doesn't mean that doesn't make the pick good or bad. I mean, look at, you know, how we reacted to the Carter Mazer, Carter Mazer pick last year. We didn't think that was a bad pick, but we were like, oh, he could have been had later. Carter Mazer has been phenomenal. Has we've had Edgar on our face ever since. So, to me, this is a year where it's been like, yeah, you know, the Red Wings are like a lot of other teams where, where they'll spend the pick where they think they have to, to, regardless if they think this guy's a true third or fourth or fifth round talent or he would slide down there. They don't risk losing their guy. They seem to be very much a team to just spend what they need to get their guy. We saw that with Dylan James. We saw that with Dmitry Pachelnikov, where a lot of the scouting consensus might say those would have been available around or two later at the very least. Um I agree with you, Brad. The Bichelnikov upside, I love. I really like the Lombardi pick. The rest of the, the the rest of the guys they they picked, I can see why. Especially Dylan James, uh, I can see how they can have an impact on the ice, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how they progress. No one has me jumping out of my chair. Were there players where I'm like, I I wish Detroit would have taken them? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Del Bell Blues as a centerman would have been really cool to have with pick 40, but knowing that I'm falling out of my chair because they passed up on. So all in all, I like what they did with the Marco Casper pick. I like what they did at the Buchelnikov pick, and everything else is is par for course. So whelmed, B, B minus, sure. If you want to give a draft grade anything in the in the average range with the stipulation that Draft draft grades are all arbitrary, and this doesn't matter until we see how it plays out. Um, I think some teams go for higher upside, which, like you, is my personal preference, but it doesn't mean it's the only right way. So, yeah, it's it's Casper's the headline for me, but Chelnikov is the exciting part, and everything else is is just a wait and see. Yeah, I I would agree with all of that. Um, like you guys said, the draft. The draft result will live and die by Marco Casper, I think. If if he hits and becomes a second line center, don't really care about anybody else because you can fill those voids in other drafts or by other means. Um The other pick I really liked, if you couldn't tell, is the Bichelnikov pick. <laughs> um hot take. Yeah, very hot take. Like infin infinity upside or complete whiff. Um, but I love it. I love those types of picks. So from a total draft perspective, I thought it was just, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't an all-star level draft. I think it was just good. It was just a, it was just a mediocre, do what you got to do draft. Yeah. I've tried to not give draft rankings anymore based on what my list looks like, because as you explained well, everybody's list looks so different. And for as chaotic as we thought this draft would be in terms of ranges on prospects, again, if you look at this draft in like 10 pick segments, it went about as expected. Nobody really plummeted from what we thought. So obviously a lot of the guys off my board that I had in my top 40, most of my top 40 was gone by 40. So yeah. it, was, it was only a handful of guys. There wasn't they, a Jagger Furcus there. There wasn't an Owen Beck there. Like, yeah, they went. They went. There were, again, guys that I liked better there. I, I was able to do enough digging to have detailed notes on about 45 to 50 guys this year. And then a bunch beyond that who I had some notes on, but I didn't put them in my top 
45, 50. So I didn't do like super deep research on them because, you know, time. Um, but it, the Dylan James pick really pissed me off because I barely had internet Wi-Fi at the time. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't in my top 50, but I know I had notes on him. But I couldn't pull the damn notes up because it wasn't <laughs> loading. I was uh, getting so angry. I'm like, I know this guy. Who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and of all days for <laughs> of all days for that nationwide outage to happen, it's when you're covering a team who you know goes for the names where you have to dig to find yeah. the notes starting in the second round. Uh who are some teams who had you know, talking about if we're going to sit here and say, yeah, we think this team drafts really well. Uh, we we reference Carolina. Gleb Trick is off at 60. Vladimir Gruden at 156. Depending on how you feel about him, Cruz Lucius at 124. Um, that's a team that that's how they draft. Yeah. All the time, that's how they draft. They need one or two guys to hit, and it's a phenomenal draft for them, especially relative to where Carolina was picking because I don't think they had a first rounder. No, they did But they've got several candidates to be top six, top four guys. Can we, can we also talk about Seattle's walking away with Shane Wright and Jagger Furcus with their two first picks? They tripped and fell into maybe a, the best draft of any team. Like That was fantastic. They are they win for not overthinking it. it was easy to do, right? Yeah. Like That was great from them. I'll, it's like the, the 2018 draft where at uh, pick 30, Tyler Wright looked almost stunned to be picking Joe Valeno at mm -hmm. that point because he was not supposed to be available then. That was Seattle's entire draft. It's like, uh... Can we take Shane Wright? Yeah, he's yeah. yeah are you sure? sure? Yeah. Okay, we'll take him. And then thirty-five. Did we miss something? Or is Ferk is still there? No, he's still there. Okay, we'll take him. They like they were practically they had hopping some, to the stage, and they had some good picks beyond that too. Even later in the draft, and um, I really liked Buffalo's what Buffalo did with three first rounders. Yes, I hate that it was a team in our division, but you know, walking away with uh, Savoy, Osland, and Coolidge, that's a that's a tidy piece of work in yeah. one day. I thought Columbus did a really good job too. Um, they took David Yurchek and Denton Matejchuk, yeah. who will probably play together. Yeah, they're very, they're very complementary of one another. Yeah, that's a good. Where point. Yurchek's just plays a big, kind of like a Mo Sider, and then Denton Matejchuk's very shifty and plays a very mobile type game. Um, if you're going to solidify a pairing for the for the future until you have to pay because of the cap. Um, what a great way to do it. First four picks, like think of this upside. Yurichek, Matejchuk, Del Bell, Belouz, and Dume. Oh, yeah. I forgot Del Bell, Belouz. Yeah, yeah. A lot of talent there. So, you know, you're looking at this and you're like, well, you guys just named a, a lot of guys you've talked about pre-draft that went to other teams. And we said it before. This is what this is how the Red Wings and a lot of other teams operate. So this is a uh, this is a draft that's headlined by Casper. It's, it's going to be largely influenced by what Bachelnikov does. And there's the reasoning behind the other picks where you're like, that makes sense for the pipeline. And, and based on the kind of players the Red Wings like to draft, this was a prototypical Detroit Red Wings draft. And it's easy to say, does it work? Does it not? Well, generally, when you get out of the first round, it's not going to work more, way more often than it does work because that's the nature of the draft. But just to give you a perspective, one of the more recent examples I can think of a Red Wing or a Red Wings pick. That was just off my board that I was familiar with, but I didn't do a deep dive on because, again, he wasn't on the consensus rankings high enough, which is what we have to generally do our research off of to know who's worth time diving in, was Albert Johansson. We, I, like when we, they picked him late in the second round, I was familiar with him. I had some notes on him, never did a deep dive on him because he wasn't high enough on the consensus rankings to the point where I felt it was worth doing a deep dive on him. That worked out all right. So far, yeah. Yeah. Now, there's other players like um, that hasn't worked on, but there. if you want to know, well, has this worked for Detroit before? That's the best, most recent example I can give you. Yeah. Would have loved, like, again, I don't disagree with you. Would have loved the more upside swing picks, but it's, there's not just one way to, mm -hmm. or is it not? No, there is one way to bake a cake. There's not just one way to do something. I thought Montreal had a really good draft, too. <laughs> Evan's just disregarding my... Yeah. yeah. I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah, Montreal and their... Lane Hudson, Owen Beck, Slavkovsky, and is it pronounced Mazar? Mishar, I think. Yeah, like, fantastic upside, lots of NHL skill set in all of those players. Unfortunately, it had to be Montreal, so... Yeah. That uh, is the only thing that sucks about that. Lane Hudson's 5'8", 155. Tiny. Jeez. Yeah. He, if it doesn't work out, he can be a horse jockey. He can be a podcast uh, host on the Wingville podcast. That's right.
I don't know. He's too light for anybody on here. He's pretty close to your weight, eh? Uh, I think I have him beat by about 12 pounds right now. Something like that. So, we can talk about how much I hated the Coyotes draft. So, well, actually, let's talk about a couple other things here before we wrap up. In the press conference or the media availability after, Eisman said um, – he, he talked about a few different things. But he talked about that there were one or two things in the draft, I think he told said to, to Max – that he was hoping to get done that just didn't come to fruition. Such as? And, you know, he didn't elaborate. And he said the it, the book's not closed on getting more things done. But I can't help but think, just by logic and just by what we talked about earlier when he was walking by the Arizona table, that as Shane Wright and Logan Cooley were there at three and four, he wasn't working his ass off to get one of them. You have to think that was one of the things he was pulling up the phone for, right? Oh, very, very strong chance. And uh, we talked about it before. There was, he was probably trying to get back into the first round. For who, we don't know. But it, it, the draft was lining up and everything that was indicate all the indications beforehand were that Eisman was going to try and be aggressive in moving upwards in this draft. And it didn't happen, which is why he probably made that statement. Um. There was also talks of, well, the Red Wings, uh, Jeff Merrick said that the Red Wings are one of the leading candidates on picking up Yessi Puliyarvi from Edmonton, who we've talked about in the past. Toronto was thinking about picking up Matt Murray, uh, and they also dealt uh, Peter Mrazek. So are any of those goalie moves the one that came to fruition and one didn't? Is that something that Detroit was in on? That's also a question. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt Murray nixed a trade to Buffalo, so you know Otto was trying to cap dump him. And, I mean, the the... Huso thing kind of rules it out now, but yeah, I mean, the fact that the Red Wings got Huso leads me to believe they probably weren't in on the Murray and the Mrazic things because they were looking for a more upside, uh, more not permanent, but like an actual goaltending solution, not acquiring an asset just to get a backup goalie. And then uh, other things that he talked about. I mean, we talked about Huso and how he believes he gives the Red Wings a chance to win with Ned coming in every night and it doesn't prevent them from extending Ned. Uh, but yeah, the most interesting parts were, were him talking about what else is to be done. So there's a lot to come Free agency is starts July 13th. We'll see what the Red Wings do. Um, Chris Draper had a lot of things to say about uh, the Red Wings draft picks, but obviously the rock me Amadeus line was, was the most entertaining part of that. That's a wrap on the 2022 NHL draft for the Red Wings. It's just another step, and in, in the Red Wings are now approaching a very pivotal uh, offseason where it looks like they're starting to continue with Eisman's quest of retooling the team to make them better. They went out and brought the goalie in, as, as a lot of us thought they would. I think we were a little surprised that it was Huso, but I think, again, he priced himself back into the Red Wings' range, and there's quite a bit of work to be done now starting July 13th. So that's the draft. Let's get on to uh, Overtime, which is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast. if you want to join the Dub Dub Club. Uh, we had our day two of the draft Patreon exclusive hangout. It was a little bit foiled by the downfall of Rogers and uh, a lack of connection. So you guys were stuck with me in a very limited capacity. Brad and Evan were trying to piece together Wi-Fi using some bits of copper they found on the ground and some rocks. So uh, patrons, we are going to make it up to you by doing something soon. We don't know what we'll, uh, we'll make sure. Um, it was kind of a shame that our annual tradition got spoiled this year by that. So we'll find a way to, to make it up to you, but thank you all so much for, for your support. It was still a blast hanging out with you in, in that room, watching rounds two through seven go by very quickly. And uh, to all of you new pat- patrons, I know a lot of you found out about uh, the Patreon during the live stream and, and joined Thank you. Seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're wondering how we're able to do like two-hour mega episodes reviewing the draft, watching all this tape, um, all the bonus content and everything to come, it's because of our Patreon supporters. So the Dub Dub Club, we love you. We appreciate you. And uh, if you want to join, patreon.com slash podcast. Let's take some questions. Dungeon Master of Puppets says, "What? which was the more shocking disappointment over these past two days? Arizona trading up to draft Connor Geeky or Rogers Network dropping the ball? Keep cool, Gabagool. The network thing has left me more infuriated than I have been in a long, long time. I'll tell you that. In the Patreon exclusive uh, episode, I'll go in detail what my day was like yesterday. That Rogers thing has pissed me off more than just about anything in the last decade. <laughs> yeah. I uh, At least Geeky has upside, right? Yeah. No, I was trading those three picks for Geeky was an awful idea, but it affects me in no way. So. <laughs>
Mitchell De Bruyne said De Bruyne. So I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Apparently it's not De Bruyne. It says with the draft over and a surprising addition in who so who what do you see as a probable move by Eisman coming in free agency? Do we need another winger or defenseman more? I also was watching uh, awesome watching my first live draft stream with you guys. Side note, someone needs to see what Xavier Willette is up to because his new house on my route is massive. Um, what is a probable move? I would say bringing in a defenseman is key on the left side. Protect these goalies, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Between loan, hopefully getting a better defensive structure in, you're still going to need guys who are capable at – implementing it so I, I would say a defenseman is top priority and you know not just for the goalies the you, you need to protect Moritz Sider against a sophomore slump you need to protect Simon Edvinson from having to play far too many minutes in a rookie year you just need a better defense and the person who would have told you this all before we did is Steve Eisman so that's I think very much on his uh, radar. Paul Breda asks any comparables available for this Bichelnikov kid. Have not heard what the Wings have said, so any info is appreciated. You had one earlier, which was a little bit of an extreme example, but in terms of play style, poor, poor man's Kucherov. So find your <laughs> highly skilled, insanely talented Russian out of nowhere. Everyone's going to be saying Datsuk. <laughs> Wasn't Kucherov drafted something fifty something overall? <laughs> hey, I'll take I'll take some prophecy right here. Um, Brad Stepsul says, no matter what Eisman might say, I find it hard to believe they didn't preferentially choose centers this year. Casper makes sense from what we know Eisman likes, and I don't think that his position factored that much in selecting him. Even so, they went back to that same well again and again and again on day two. So do you buy my conspiracy theory? Everything out of the first round positionality does not matter at all because there's such long shots to make the team. You cannot possibly draft a guy, a center in like hypothetically the fourth round because you need centers because he's probably never going to play for your team, statistically speaking. So you're, you're just picking guys at that point that you think can beat the odds and somehow even claw their way to the NHL. So, uh, not, not a way to build a roster. So I would say no. CNOD says short and sweet. Will there be a rookie camp this year? That was where we saw Mo show off for the first time. I think it starts this week. Well, we'll see how that all uh, all develops. John Helmkamp, brand new Dub Dub supporter. John, always love the support. Thank you so much. He says, hey, boys, glad to finally be part of the Dub Dub Club. What does Elmer Soderbloom need to show to break uh, camp with Detroit with the Red Wings to start the 2022 season? Uh, I personally can't wait for our team to get even taller. So what does Soderbloom have to do to be able to make the Red Wings out of camp? Uh, simply play at NHL pace. Yeah. It's simply that. We know he's got the size to do it. We know he's got the skills to do it, but the hardest part about getting to the NHL is matching the pace and physicality of that league. Uh, Miss Days says, love Casper and the Russian kid. Good swings for the fences there. Over the draft, it was announced that Strom would not be qualified by Chicago. Do you expect Steve to be all over that? Puce 2.0 seems an easy, reasonable two-year contract for someone with potential upside, and especially if we think Puce gets flipped at the deadline. Um. I don't think it has much to do with Pews getting flipped at the deadline. Um, but yeah, I think it would be natural for Eisman to be in on that because they, Marco Casper ain't fall, ain't filling that center hole this year. So yeah. someone has to. And uh, if you miss out on a guy like Trocek, Strom would be a pretty decent fallback. Oh, Joseph. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Wet ass Huso says, maybe, just maybe, this is the year that Eisman opens up the checkbook and brings talent in as an incentive for Larkin and Bertuzzi to not have to slog through another rebuilding year before heading to free agency. I'm still not sold on Marco Casper uh, being a second line center and still would have strongly preferred Savoy or Nazar at eight, but I'll be glad to be proven wrong if he gets there. I'll say the same thing you guys said after Sider was drafted. This is now a Marco Casper fan account and I will be cheering for him to succeed. Stay fresh, cheese bags. That's pretty much the approach you have to take, no matter where you are on him. Evans Bankrupt Parking Garage says, Hey guys, I appreciate the draft coverage these last few days in the streams. I was there the entire time both days, and that first day was exhausting. You did what you could on Friday, even if that was Evan Golfin at the beginning. You went to a golf course to try to find Wi Fi, which is the most Evan brand. I was on a pilgrimage. Yeah. Who is your gem of the draft for the Red Wings? I'm personally a bit frustrated that we didn't do that trade with Toronto from Razik and their first for our first second pick. Uh, we would have had the goalie tandem and then we could have had Lane or not Lane, Brad Lambert. He was a steal then and would have been worth the risk, even though I would have taken him at eighth in general. I don't think the Red Wings would have taken him. No, 
doesn't seem to he he doesn't strike me as the Red Wings type, which I know we mentioned before, but I don't think even if they trade up. Plus, that was a horrible trade for Chicago. Like they took on two years of an awful contract of a declining goalie for thirteen picks. Like it wasn't like they just got the first round pick. They swapped an early second for a late first. It was not a huge upgrade. Did not like that trade for Chicago at all. Um, T- Keenan O'Donohue says Casper has more puck skill than he's getting credit. If anyone remembers a specific commentary about Mo Sider, he was told in both his draft and draft plus one years to focus on defense and not be flashy. This could be the same case. Sider certainly wasn't pulling stuff through his legs and stick handling around people then. Plus, Casper's affinity for stick twirl sellies is nice. <laughs> That's a real indicator right there. <laughs> yeah, that could be the case. And, and like we said, um, playing in the SHL as a young kid has a way of stifling offensive output. Like you're not going to be kicking the door down essentially at that point. All right. Uh, like we said to the patrons, we recorded this early morning um, to get the episode out for people as quickly as we could after the draft. Uh, we're going to be back with you likely midweek uh, unless something notable happens before then. Um, but keep an eye out patrons. We're going to be doing more. If you have more draft questions, Stick them in the next overtime as well. There's going to be a, a lot of additional stuff coming out, not just in terms of public draft uh, content, but for all of our uh, Patreon supporters. So thank you all so much. That is the 2022 NHL draft slog done. Uh, if you have opinions, if you have thoughts, if you have uh, feelings, if you agree or disagree, subscribe, leave a comment. Uh, tell us why we're right or wrong. The discussion is not over on the draft. So, I appreciate you all appreciate you all tuning in. I think we're ready to go take massive, massive naps. All right, before we wrap up, we want to thank all of our listeners, the sponsors of this podcast, the FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, all of you who have newly joined the show, all uh, returning listeners, all of our Patreon supporters, our name level sponsors, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Ake Fur, the Stay Fresh Cheese Bag, Nick Perks, Nicholas Brodeen, who I believe is a new name level sponsor, Brett, Brett Bailey, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan Hannah's Banana Slam and Jamathong, Matthew M. Rice, Brandon M., Carl Brutana Nealuski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Welcome, Connor, and thank you for your support at the Dub Dub Club. Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Craig Kibble, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Doesn't Tuesn It, Give Blood Fight Probert, Greech, Helm was held back by Blashell, Hassam Al Qasem, I Leave My Wife for Cider, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Kalen Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Marcus, Matt McKay, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Scott Martin, Sean Levine, Wet Ass Huso, Sam Bankson, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, now, Adam Now I Finished Better Than Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog is a Stanley Cup champion, Ben Barron, Brian Vasha, Connor Leighton, Dave W., Dungeon Master of Puppets, Evans Bankrupt Parking Garage, Evans Bingo Card, G-Rated Snowblower Joke, um, Jack the Bassist, James Laporte, Jeremiah Adobo, Jeremy Brocker, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Marco Casper, hey, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Max, A Million Cheese Bags, Papa Woody, Puck Norris, Revy DeLuca, Thick Rick, Trevor Pevavar, Zach McCann, A Driving Range Superstar. Thank you all so very much and uh i mean next time we talk it might be free agent frenzy thanks for tuning in to the winged wheel podcast be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com where you can subscribe to the show on itunes spotify or wherever you get your podcasts you'll also find links to other ways to support the show such as patreon official podcast apparel and more and don't forget to follow the show on twitter at winged wheel pod and of course the hosts at brad crisco at ryan hannah wwp and at hockey town evan